From 2019, the FIA will mandate a new safety standard with regards to helmet design in F1. The new design and specification is the result of a decade of research and will make for the safest, most literally bulletproof helmet used in motorsport. But we get ahead of ourselves. Let's have a look back at how we got to today's pretty incredible helmet standards from way back before scientists had even invented colour. Before F1, when the very idea of safety was laughed out of the paddock, racing drivers would fly around the track very much exposed, with nothing to protect their heads but a pair of goggles and a cloth cap. The goggles, of course, kept the dust grit and oil out of their eyes, and the cloth, or sometimes leather cap, was mainly used for keeping warm from the chill of the fast-moving air. Sometimes primitive visors were attached to the peak of this headgear, for those that preferred slightly less constrictive eyewear. Now to be fair, at the time there weren't that many solutions available, and honestly the fact that it might be a good idea to more substantially protect your head when racing hadn't really caught on. Fast cars were a fairly new concept. The first somewhat protective helmets, becoming commonly used in the 40s and mandated-ish in the 50s, were little more than polo helmets. These were basically hard hats, the structure of which was formed from sheets of cotton layered together and soaked in resin to form a hard shell. These often sat like a builder's hat or a soldier's helmet, right above the ear. It wasn't until 1954 that the first mass-produced helmet became available. Produced by Bell, the 500TX extended the shape of the hard shell, which was now made of fiberglass laminate, further down to cover the sides and base of the head. These helmets were the most effective designs of their time and the first to be safety certified by Snell. Now, the Snell Foundation was set up in 1957 following the death by head injury of Pete Snell in a motor race. From then until now, Snell has been at the forefront of research and development in helmet protection, as well as providing recognised safety standards for helmets in motorsport and transit across the world. F1 now uses the FIA standards in helmets, but until 2015, Snell was still the reference point. Now you may notice the Bell 500 design has a big gaping hole across most of the face, an area you might consider worth protecting. Though cloth and leather scarves, skirts and face masks had been used for many years in order to keep dirt and debris from striking the face or getting in the mouth, it wasn't until 1968 that a full face helmet was used in F1. Its design was adapted from those used by dirt bikers who were very much at the forefront of not trying to swallow an unhealthy dose of dirt and stones. Naturally this helmet was immediately ridiculed, as all safety developments that come with an aesthetic change usually are. <clears throat> but in the coming years it would become the new standard among drivers in F1, shielding from debris and protecting the chin and jaw when striking the steering wheel or chassis in an accident. Up until relatively recently, the risk of fire was very much a life and death reality. The head needed to be protected as much as any part of the body and as such you don't want the helmets to catch fire, particularly the lining and padding. In 1968, during the boom of synthetic materials, Nomex was introduced into the lining and padding of the helmet. Now, a Nomex is an artificial fibre that can be woven into a fabric. Its brilliance lies in the fact that it doesn't burn readily and so will extinguish as soon as it's removed from a fire, and it has a very low heat conductivity. This means that heat from a fire will not travel easily through Nomex materials, so the helmet can be exposed to some pretty significant flames, while the head inside will take a long while to feel anything more than a Norwegian sauna. Now, while a helmet didn't cover every inch of the head, this was a significant step up. The 70s saw a prevalence of flip-up visors designed into the helmet itself, though in their early years there was no particular standard for this and a variety of interesting designs were seen on display. It wasn't until much later that the visor itself would become an integral part of keeping the driver safe. So by the end of the 1970s, the basic helmet, at least superficially, had developed pretty much to the design we recognise today. Full, hard head coverage with a letterbox for the eyes and a detachable flip-up visor. Development and refinement focused on improving the ability of the helmet to resist impact, deformation and related injurious effects. Testing standards and crash tests were continually improved by organisations like Snell and the FIA, bringing us the helmets we use today in F1, the current highest standard of motor racing helmet in the world. So let's examine today's helmet. The exact structure of a helmet's hard shell varies between manufacturers, but essentially the material is laminar, meaning it's made of thin layers, and includes in its makeup various carbon composites and metals, carbon fibre for structural strength, and Kevlar. Now Kevlar, a synthetic fabric, is useful in two ways. Firstly, it's very fire resistant, similar to Nomex in this regard. Secondly, its strong, tightly woven fibres make it incredibly resistant to penetration from projectiles or sharp objects. These fibres are so strongly interwoven that it's incredibly hard to separate them, which is why it's also used in bullet and knife-proof vests. And while it's all well and good that the hard part of the helmet can stop projectiles and keep heavy impacts from crushing the head inside, if the impact causes a sudden heavy movement to the head, even if the head itself is not injured, your brain can still be kicked around inside your skull, causing a massive amount of damage. See, your brain is a sort of pudding-like structure and brain damage tends to come from massive acceleration, whipping the brain around inside the head, which can sever or damage connections in the brain. It's kind of like if you had a can of alphabetic spaghetti that was arranged in perfectly alphabetical order inside the can. If you shook the can up, 
you'd mess up the order of the spaghetti inside, even if the can itself is perfectly pristine on the outside. Such is the tricky business of protecting the brain. The goal, as in almost all motorsport safety features, is to reduce acceleration in accidents. In this case, the acceleration of the head, and then by reaction, the brain. And this is where the padding comes in. The idea of it being to provide room for the head to crash into, deforming to absorb the energy of the accelerating helmet, and reducing the acceleration imparted to the head. So if the helmet is struck, the outer part of the helmet will accelerate much more strongly than the head inside, as the padding is specifically strong enough to resist accelerating the head, dampening the energy into its foam structure. This is very similar to the way tyre barriers, for example, deform to absorb the energy of a crashing car, thereby reducing its sudden deceleration. You may also notice that a modern helmet might have a bit more sculpting or attached fairings to it than just being a big smooth ball, and this is to help with aerodynamics, and not just for the car's sake. With the introduction of the halo, this has become less of an issue, but a driver's head poking out of the cockpit right smack in the middle of the airflow provides something of an aerodynamic challenge. Adding some sculpting to the shape of the helmet that allows the air to flow more efficiently around it can significantly reduce the power deficit that a regular helmet induces via drag. Not only that, but by smoothing out the air around the helmet we can reduce the turbulent air that can not only rattle the helmet quite severely, but even lift the helmet, sucking it upwards, which is dangerous and puts pressure on the throat. Today's visor continues to shield against dirt and bugs, and can be made in different tints for different lighting conditions. It includes several layers of tear-offs, which are sticky membranes, very similar to phone screen protectors that can be literally torn off and thrown away one by one as they become dirty through a session. But there is a lot more to the modern visor. It also acts as a defensive layer against projectiles that may penetrate that gaping hole in the middle of the helmet. The visor is made of a clear polycarbonate material that is strong and flame resistant, able to absorb energy through deformation when struck, and pretty good at resisting penetration. In the wake of an accident in which Felipe Massa was struck in the face with a flying spring at about 200 70 kilometers an hour, a Xylon strip was added to the visor for extra protection. Straddling the top edge of the helmet, Xylon is stronger at absorbing impact energy than carbon fiber, so it provides a large area around the most vulnerable part of the helmet to protect the driver from small projectiles, the likes of which Massa experience. So 2019 then, enter the new high standard in helmet design. Now firstly, it's important to note that this isn't actually a specific helmet, it's more a set of standards and parameters around which helmet manufacturers are expected to produce their helmets. So Bell, Shoebirth, Arai, etc. are all expected to produce their own models to fit this specification. The most noticeable difference here is the narrower letterbox through which the drivers see. It may look a little sight restrictive, but there have been historical helmets that were way harder to see out of, and the Xylon strip used in recent years actually comes down further than the letterbox will in 2019. In fact, the reason the top of the letterbox has been shifted downwards for the new helmet is because the protection provided by the Xylon strip has been incorporated into the helmet's main body. The FIA have worked up a new stricter standard of tests that a homologated helmet must withstand having spent years working with all major helmet manufacturers on being able to produce helmets capable of surviving such strict challenges. You can see from these standards that the deceleration of the head inside the helmet is specifically measured in the impact tests. There is also now a more specific test for penetration from high speed debris or ballistics, and a specific check on the visor itself being able to withstand small pellet-like debris at high speed. With deliveries, sponsorship and visors finalised for each driver, it's unlikely we as spectators will notice much different in the helmets next year, as striking as the new model may seem displayed naked on a podium like this. And for a sport where drivers fly around up to 300 kilometers an hour with their head poking out of the car, with the halo and this new helmet, F1 may well have narrowed the risk of severe head injury to extremely extraordinary circumstances.